what is it? Oh, it's, it's in its founding list. Wow. Tonight should be more so than what we have here at Link. And they're similar. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of billion here and there do make it. Although, although the court's capital budget is bigger than ours is. No. <laughs> Which, if you look at the fact that they only have four million dollars of property tax revenue, having forty-eight million dollars capital budget is pretty amazing thing. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. There you go. I'll leave that and get some signatures on that water line out there. It's amazing that people come up and say, well, we're going to hook up. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> fire flu in the airport and thank you for me. It may someday get there. Yeah, yeah. we'll be fine. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, I think that was my point. It said, we need to make sure that the fans will extend it out. Yeah, you know, is that line big enough for all the no. purposes that you were asked for? My impression is if we want to be Jim did this stuff in the summer on six or seven hundred years, you just might find that pretty high. And then also the fact that's industrial property, we got a couple of parts that we like to rent once you get your car. Yeah, well, and I know that there's exactly there's. There are people that approach saying they want to get hangers out there. That, yeah, that's like that's wild. Some people think about it. Some people think about it. yeah now with the kids one day 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 one you know, they theoretically would be the flip of the First day with the car, and then something was talking about one thing, but there's not any issues. I need to go and buy it. Yeah. I know that was one. And, you know, one for the chair to go. Well, I don't know. Yes. Give me the part of the time. Those were two realistic. You got to go. Otherwise, I would. I mean, it'd be interesting. It's, it's going to be interesting. But, uh, it's, 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 as far as I know, uh, I haven't heard any um, negative feedback. Yeah, yeah, it does. And no sidebars and no side exactly. <laughs> but it's so much clearer into the presentation, and it's so much easier to use the tablets. Yeah, Robert. I don't know if you've got my email with that, but uh, I didn't have it. Oh, interesting. Uh, like a week ago. So, okay. Well, I tried to line them up with the agenda, the current agenda. So, okay. Hopefully, that will help. Yeah, yeah. You want to know, Laura, when you're ready. So, do you want to run it? It does not. It involves another virus. Oh, I think so. Oh, I think so. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, and on the other end, the Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Link Transport Transit Board meeting of November 15, 2022. It's now 302 in the afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Clerk of the board, can you confirm if we have a quorum? Quorum established. Thank you very much. This is the opportunity for the public to comment on any topic that's not currently on the agenda. We have anybody online or present in the boardroom that would like to make a comment on any topic not on the agenda. For education chair, we only take public comment via email and or um, if it's mailed to the board clerk. Okay, and you have not received it. Okay, great. All right. With that, we will then proceed with the consent agenda. We do have one correction. We are going to amend the minutes of the October 18th special meeting to reflect that uh, Shalane Mayor Bob Getty was present and alert at that meeting. So <laughs> we will uh, make that correction. With that amendment, this is a an action item and I would entertain a motion. Motion approved. Second. And we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We have some board administration and communication uh, information that we'd like to go into next. And Laura, I think you've got some fun news for us. I do. I actually have um, the privilege of acknowledging Gary Robledo, who's our journey maintenance te technician. Sorry. Um, he actually was out and about in our community and noticed that there was a vehicle on the side of the road who needed help. Um, the gentleman was about 75 years old and had a flat tire um, through communication. And as Gary helped him um, fix his flat tire, you know, it came about that he worked at Link Transit. So the gentleman who um, was helped on the side of the road did submit a guest comment that you actually received in your um, packet. And we'd like to acknowledge Gary with a high five award. Fantastic. Way to go, Gary. He's not here with us. He today. actually is on vacation, so he couldn't join us today. Okay. All right. Very good. Richard, do you want to tell us about the vehicle research trip that's upcoming? Sure. Um, so I think probably everyone's seen the email I sent out on this topic. I'll just kind of cover cover over for looking at. About a year ago, uh, when we had our group go to the out show in Florida, we came across a new vendor in Busco, which is a, a Dutch company that had brought a vehicle to the show. And as I chatted with them and then Ed chatted with the president of the company, we were very impressed with what they had in the vehicle and um, its capabilities, uh, what was the way it's reported. Um, and with a sense of knowledge that is really unusual, uh, I guess is the best way to put this. I mean, they add 
every, you know, they understood all the issues with electric vehicles, understand how they work, they had great data. When Ed challenged on a couple of information, pulled his phone out, started bringing up reports on buses that were operating in Switzerland and in uh, the Netherlands and, and showed us, you know, this is exactly how many kilowatts, uh, kilowatts per kilometer they're using. This is the battery temperature on this bus. And, you know, it was just, it was astounding information that they had already into their software and other things. Uh, they indicated that they were shopping their, their vehicle, if you will, and they had intentions to open a plant in the U.S. and become a U.S. provider. They had actually, at that time, had signed a letter of agreement with the state of Ohio, but that is falling through. They're still looking for uh, a land to support them to build a manufacturing plant here. Uh, but they wanted to do a demonstration uh, of their stuff in the United States. And based on what we heard, so we probably be interested because the technology they were proposing um, will probably allow us to run the rubbish land, uh, which is something we didn't think was possible with the existing technologies that we've seen through the US certified manufacturers right now. It's not radically different than our current buses. It's just the next generation of batteries that are out there. And the big difference for them is they build their bus out of carbon fiber. So the bus weighs a ton less than EYD or Gilly does with their steel frame vehicles. And that weight savings allows you to use a lot less energy. So they can, with that next generation of battery. So our right now, our 35 foot coaches have 393 kilowatts of power on them. This bus is 580 kilowatts of power on it. Um, it's a 40 foot coach, so it's larger, and then the, the, that allows you to put more batteries. But when we looked in the marketplace, 500 and over 500 kilowatts is unusual its availability. BYD's biggest 40 foot is what, worst 90, I think they told us. Yeah, right, under 500. Right, right. Um, and they're heavier, so they don't get the range that you need to do this. With this vehicle, particularly the way that we operate our up in the one where they come back, um, most of them come back in the midday and go back to the yard. You can do a once a day plug in and make this bus run without any problem. They do, they do 500 ki uh, kilometers in service. Our longest version of this route is about 520 miles. So you would have to plug in at least once to make it work, but a 30 minute lunch plug would probably be enough to make the thing be able to work all day. Um, which is possible in our system. So that was all very interesting. And then they also recognized the price difference that you see between US and, and other buses. And so they were gonna give us a proposal and it just has waited and waited and waited. And a couple, about a month and a half ago, they sent us a proposal um, for this vehicle. A lot less than I was expecting, um, you know, almost, $500,000 cheaper than the nearest comparable American vehicle. Um, and, you know, they they wanted us to do 10. We don't need 10 buses. That's six as a demonstration. But the issue is they're not in the U.S. yet. They won't have a plant operating two years here. I mean, that's, that's realistically. They intend to start selling in the private market into the airports and other places. And so they, they, they're confident they're going to have parts and uh, support distribution. What they proposed for us is they would assign someone to us to work in our facility, parts by themselves to keep the vehicles in good shape. And again, included in the price of the vehicle, which is also an exceptional offer. So, it, you know, in some ways, it was like, it's almost too good to be true. Um, and then when we did the math on the costs, this, we run, we, so Ed and I sat down and calculated what we're spending on diesel fuel to run the diesel bus into Chelan. Just the Chelan route costs us $400,000 a year in diesel fuel to base prices. Uh, and they're not anticipated to fall anytime the next year. Um, in electricity to run that vehicle, it costs us about seventy-five thousand a year. So three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year savings in energy costs uh, to run this vehicle. And if you take that over the life of the vehicle, you actually pay for the vehicle in energy cost savings. So you know, that's beyond belief. Uh, again, too good to be true type of story. Uh, 
but they've got a lot behind them that makes us believe there's a lot there. So as we talked about it, we said, really, if we want to make a recommendation to the board, we need to see this in reality. We need to talk to a couple of their customers that are operating these vehicles and see if they actually, you know, they actually perform the way that, that they say they are. You know, we, we heard lots of promises on the BYDs. We had lots of promises on our e-buses before we got them. Um, and we did a little bit of, you know, a little bit of work before we got those, but it would be useful to actually go talk to some people up front. So they've offered to arrange a tour for us, which would be that they've identified a couple of customers they would like us to talk to. Um, their plant is about two hours south of Amsterdam, a little town called Moarne in the Netherlands. And so we want to go there and see what that looks like, see what their park system operates like, what the plant looks like, make sure that they're, you know, it's not what we saw with but with eBus where we kind of walked into their facility and went, oh my God, this is what we're buying. Um, but, um, on, you know, just with almost shade tree where that's not our impression, but we want to make sure that's in fact what we're getting. Um, and then they want us to go to um, the Shell Airport, which is the Amsterdam Airport. They have 130 buses operating there. Um, they've asked us to go to Munich, where they're operating buses from Munich into Switzerland and the mountains uh, in cold temperatures, which is something we'd be very interested in too. And then Berlin. Um, the city system is operating the fiber, carbon fiber vehicle, and, and at the airport, they're operating a steel chassis version of this, which they also offered to us, but it, it wouldn't do the range because it's got the weight problem. Um, but Berlin is the biggest operator of the carbon fiber vehicle. And so it said, you know, you can actually talk to people that are operating. And they, I think they told us they have 60 of them, the carbon fiber vehicles. Yeah. There. So it's, again, there are people are operating at scale. Which was also something that was very interesting you know, to find out. So that was the intention. And then thinking about this, particularly with my you know, retirement in August, these vehicles, oh, they've also promised they deliver the vehicles in several months if we get an order. So they'll be delivered this summer. Um, while they can be delivered while I'm still here, they're going to be operated by whoever the new G GM is and, and staff. And if there are any issues, I really want to have ownership of this by the board as well. And so that's why I've asked to have a couple of board members attend and the you know, current chair and next year's chair because the purchase question, if this check checks out the way it is, our intention would be to come back and make a recommendation probably in December or January to purchase and then for delivery in the summer um, in service is sort of what is the vision. And really it's because of the fuel cost savings, the fact that they pay for themselves is pretty astounding. We don't need to replace the diesel to run. They're four and a half years, five, five years old. They've got 275,000 miles on them. They'll typically get at least 500,000 is the minimum we have to operate them to. But we use local money. We can do whatever we want with them. We can save them for service someplace else. We can sell, put them on the market, try to sell them. Um, matter of the board's had some interest in operating into Grant County. That's probably not an electric vehicle. It diesel probably makes more sense for that. So, and there, we think there's a use for them if we go ahead and make this decision. But the opportunity to electrify a significant part of the miles we operate and the energy savings, plus sort of getting the ground floor and the cost savings, seems like a worthwhile effort. So that's really the intention. I don't think normally I'd ask board members to come along on this, but I just thought. So enough stuff going on. There's getting the ownership and being able to communicate to new management as well. This is something that people are interested in if it's if it checks out. And until we actually see it, I don't think we can say it checks out. What they have in paper looks really, really good. So that's sort of what the, the what's out there. Um, this bus, it, of course, is not by America compliant, so you can't use federal funds to buy them. Um, they are Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Service standards. So they are built to the US standards and they've received certification from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that vehicle complies. So they do that. Um, and they are, um, they're not only looking to us, we're the client, they're looking to demonstrate the 40 foot coach. Lane Transit down Eugene has agreed to be a demonstration site where there's a 60 foot coach. There are articulated buses. So they're looking for a couple of people to 
show them in the transit world uh, to see how they operate out. Well, that all sounds really positive, especially since they want to open the plant in Rock Island, Randy. So, <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Richard? In fact, I just know the Finance Committee met on the third and uh, concurred with the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, this would be about this will be a, a five day business trip. Uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam vicinity for two days, and then the Munich, the day in Munich, and the day in Berlin, and back. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank Hearing no other questions, let's go ahead and move on. Can you want to talk about your general manager's report? Well, first, Laura needs to make an announcement to the board. So, Laura. Um, um, I actually just want to thank you. I actually have had a different opportunity pop up, and this is my last board meeting with the Link Transit Board. Um, I actually will be. What did LeBron James say? I'm taking my talents over to the city of East Wenatchee. <laughs> so you can find me there. But I thank you. Um, you guys have been a great board, and I thank the president for the opportunity to work here. So you will be missed. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you too, Chris. <laughs> you have a replacement yet? Um, Nope. <laughs> I, I have nothing to do with it. I know. <laughs> so we have Lynn and I finalized, a, and I don't think there's an ad in the paper today for the board for position. Um, we're using the same job description we used before. So I think it's right. And so we're recruiting. Um, Laura has volunteered to come in after hours and help us make the board board meeting together and do training. And I actually reached out to Maria uh, Hansen if she wanted to do some part time help with us uh, in retirement. She's a, maybe she has some health issues she's concerned with, but uh, I think we can manage for the next month or so, and um, hopefully we'll get decent candidates. Fine, won't be Laura, but decent candidates. <laughs> Yes. Well, okay. congratulations, Lauren. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's it was a great opportunity and made us question our way just because it's a significant increase. <laughs> um, a couple other things. Uh, I think you should all have in front of you an article I pulled out of the Washington Post this morning. Um, diesel fuel. We have a diesel fuel shortage happening in the state, and it's happening nationwide. Um, it's due to the war in Ukraine. Uh, they've diverted a bunch of diesel out of our supply to support Europe because of the Russian shutdown. Um, and it's real. Uh, our last fuel delivery, our truck driver told us, we're glad you didn't order diesel. There's none in the tanks. Um, and I'm talking at the Transit Association meeting I was at last week. Two of the agencies have reported they got less than half of what they ordered because of this isn't fuel. Um, this has happened before. Um, and the last time it wasn't it's been a long time, it was 2006, the last time we didn't get diesel fuel. We are at the end of the distribution pipeline. We are as far as you can get from a, a, a terminal for diesel fuel. So we're the last place to get. It. So we're the first people to run out. Um, you know, Anacortes, and Spokane, and Tri Cities are the three distribution points, and we are, like I said, equally far from all of them. So it's just uh, that's a reality. Uh, the good news is because we run so much electric vehicles, we don't use anywhere near the diesel we used to. We used to use uh, 22,000 gallons of diesel fuel a month. Uh, so we were fueling every four days. We're now using about two truckloads a month, as opposed to every four days, buying a truckload of fuel out of diesel. And the only routes that are running diesel are the Leavenworth and the uh, um, Chelan route. Um, normally, occasionally, we, we may run the, the, one of the old 35s in service, but we don't need them on a regular basis. So we'll have to play it by year. Uh, we happen to have 9,000 gallons at a time, which gives us some cushion. Um, the direction that we're taking is we're ordering as soon as the tank is low enough that we can put a load in it. 
and we'll just keep up on it rather than letting it stretch a little longer. Um, but what we're this article saying is the shortage is not going away this year. It's going to get worse over the winter because of diversion of heating fuel, heating oil, um, and uh, we're just going to be dealing with it for the next year. So and prices are going to stay high for the same reason. So uh, we are paying almost a dollar a gallon more for diesel fuel than we are for gasoline currently. So that's that's another dynamic in the background here going forward. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is when the facility was built, we were almost entirely diesel fuel. Uh, even our pet small vehicles were diesel powered. And we've gone away from that. We went to propane and we're now on gasoline for most of the small vehicles, propane, but it never showed up. Um, our gasoline tanks are only 3,000 gallons. And we have 29 gasoline powered vehicles in service, which means we have to get a gasoline delivery every three or four days. Um, and that's really expensive is they charge a thousand dollar delivery charge every time we get usually about 2000 gallon delivered. So it's, we're paying 50 cents to 70 cents a gallon delivery charge on that fuel um, because of the size of it. Um, if we can get rid of, and right now we're using about the same amount of gasoline as we use diesel fuel. The small vehicles don't go anywhere near as far as the route to Levin to Chelan is. So, there's no point in trying to switch the tanks over. But if we can take the diesels out of service on the 21 on the route to Chelan and run electric, we will actually swap and put diesel in our gasoline tanks, put our gasoline in our diesel tank and have a larger volume, which will cut the price down and actually make our gasoline operation work better to help re electrify that part. Of the fleet. Yeah. And there's a, another operational reason that makes sense. Uh, going forward for that. But I don't, you know, like I said, we, we've not run out, but we've been notified there's an issue and then independent verification. I just thought I want to share that with you and want to see how that plays out. Um, we don't have an alternative for Chelan. Um, we may start running some electric buses to Leavenworth because of the charger up there. We can probably do that. And we'll give you delivery of three more 35 foot uh, DYDs in April. Um, and the intention was then to electrify the Leavenworth line when those arrive, but we may have to do that a little earlier if fuel becomes short. That we always use, um, you know, four thousand gallons on the on the Chelan line. We're using about two thousand on the Leavenworth line, so it's distances are shorter. We only use about half as much fuel on that, but it would be a help if we could do that, and that's within the range. So we'll have to see how that all plays through. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that's it. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention as well is has been that you've seen a lot of proposals for park and rides and driver turnaround facilities. And part of that is we've been building um, and, and proposing to build a lot of restroom facilities for the operators. And that's based on couple of things, one, you know, capability to do it, but we're required to provide uh, restroom facilities for our operators. And if we have, um, the terminus of the route doesn't come back here, or it's long distance out, you need to have facility at the other ends because you have to provide access to restrooms at a reasonable basis. And the law for um, bus side says that you don't have to have them every place, but you have to have them. You have to be able to get someone to one within 10 minutes. Um, and identifying restrooms in the community, which is what we've done in the past, has become a challenge. Uh, we identified, and we had lost the restroom we've had in Waterville for many years, and we identified a new one. And by the time that we got the locks installed and got it operating, the people sold their business and we lost it again. Um, and that kind of process seems to happen in a variety of places. Uh, we're having to change another restroom because we've lost access to it because Business to students do differently. Mm -hmm. So, developing them where we have the sewer and we have the facilities as a long term strategy is, is the right thing to do. Uh, and it's the right thing for our employees as well. But that's it's based on the requirement that we have to provide access. And so, that means we have to have access at 4 o'clock in the morning, we have to have access at 10 o'clock at night, we have to have access on weekends. Mm -hmm. And as we've expanded the scope of service, that's made it much more difficult to work with local businesses to provide 
respiratory unit because they may not be open in those hours. And getting someone to give us keys or access to their business when they're closed is not as not as easy a thing as it was when we operate on the day. So that's part of the reason you're seeing a lot of the proposals is we need to get those facilities in place. And you know, we've been using porta potteries in certain areas, which them in combination with, with some facilities, I think probably meets the requirements currently, but they're not, you know, the requirement is to have hot and cold running water in them. So you have to, that doesn't obviously do it all the time. So we need to get to that place. Sure, they're not ideal. But... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're a help. And I think that's what we put them in has been to do that, but they're not, they're, they don't, they don't meet the long, right, the long term goal. We need to get there. Got it. So just curious on that issue, you've got, Port of bodies that service Leavenworth. I think they're in the DOT lot. And then you have a nice, fairly new facility at Wilcombe. Um, it does get used, but the port of bodies are getting used in conjunction with Stevens Pass uh, bus that uh, picks up employees. Can you so, um, I'm, 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 my question is why are there even port of bodies? I guess in such close proximity to this facility in in Bochum and, and I'm hearing that it's because that's what Stevens Pass is. It picks up its employees and they, not, they don't want to go down to Bochum. Nothing to do with it at all. Um, and in fact, I don't think Stevens Pass is using our port of body. Um, I think that's that a lot of time for our people only. Um, the issue is when we re restructure the routes. The commuter route doesn't always go through the whole so it's not serving, you know, it doesn't get there about half the time. And we needed a place where the restroom would be, uh, be available when the gas station wasn't open, because that's where the restroom facility is off the end of the route on, on that location. But they're not open early in the morning. And so the porta potty was an alternative location that gave us a restroom available all the time for the times that were um, And that's, that's the basic reason. We're doing it, and we're um, the city is in the process of putting a contract out to develop a parking ride at that location, which will have a public restroom, and we're working with them to try to get that developed at something that could also be used as a restroom facility for our operators. On that, the ones that don't go, in, there's some express routes that won't go in there. As we electrify that route, more of the buses will go to Wilcom, and so it'll be a trade off issue where we'll be more using the facility we have. Because um, we didn't have all the buses that we thought we were going to have, this delays in delivery, we haven't been using it quite as much as we had intended to. But, but a good, at least a third of the buses, at least the intention is, if, depending on how the charging works out, won't go to Wilcom, they will just run as express because we've had that request from. Parts of the public to have an express bus, and if we do that, we need to have a restroom available for the operators. So, so it's a temporary facility while the construction is going on. I guess it's called Glacier Views, what the parking ride is going to be called. Glacier parking lot, yeah, yeah, the big dirt DOT lot, right? So, that's going to be developed yeah. by the city as a part of it. Stay tuned, hopefully, in the spring summer. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks, Richard. Certainly. All right, Randy, would you like to give us an update on what uh, the Finance Committee discussed earlier this month? Sure, I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> um, looking at what we discussed, along with our discussion action items today, regarding uh, 6.1 on our agenda, is a request to increase the purchasing limit from 40000 to 100000 for fuel, because a tanker truck now costs more than $40,000. We don't want to go out to the competitive bid every time we buy a tanker truck or a quick diesel. Sounds like it might be going up even higher. Included in that is some uh, language changes to our policy, which I'm sure Nick will explain when he gets up here. We recommend uh, approving that. And uh, item 6.2, that's not on here, we didn't discuss that. 6.3, authorization to way to seal bidding process. This is for a marketing van and also a trade out vehicle. <clears throat> we uh, did the same thing here recently so they could buy, buy what, 10 vehicles for the ride share. Ride share. This is the exact same sort of scenario. We need to get these vehicles and we've given them authorization to do so. 
We recommend approving that. Driver and staff uniforms is this agenda item 6.5. They will explain that to us, but we approve that one and recommend passing it. Item seven is agenda 6.6, .6, hiring a recruitment firm. We recommend approving that one. There was one item on here that we discussed that I don't see anywhere on our agenda, and that was reallocating some money that was to be used by BYD for something else, or that was allocated for something else, and we're allocating for BYD. Yeah, I, 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 can, I, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so in February, you authorized the purchase, the allocation of some federal funds for the purchase of the board. Couple Ford Transit vans in Paragraph here. And we had told you at the time we didn't expect to get those via two years based on what the vendors were telling us, but the money was going to expire to get allocated. So we allocated it. Last month, Ford canceled the order and said, Nope, you're not getting vans. You don't have any available for three years. And so we're just canceling all the orders. And they're going to be much more expensive. That put our money at risk. And so we went back to the uh, state who had done the uh, manages the allocation of the funds in this case. And they agreed to allow us to go ahead and repurpose those funds. Uh, so there's about 190,000, I believe, of federal funds that were at risk. We have about $500,000 accumulated of these federal formula funds. That's not enough to buy a bus, but it's enough to buy most of a 30-foot DYD electric coach. And so we will be bringing you um, and actions will reallocate the funds in that fashion to purchase a 30 by and we'll need to do that probably next month, I guess, uh, going forward. Um, we can get the money allocated this fiscal year so we don't lose it. Um, I said it's at risk of 190,000. So they, we get a formula of about 190,000 a year. That's not enough to buy a bus, so we have to keep it for several years, but you can only keep it for four. So, we just barely get to buy a bus out of the formula dollars, uh, except this time it blew apart because of the purchase and chain issues. So, in any case, uh, we talked about the fact that we needed to reallocate those funds and go forward with that. Uh, our intention is we just won't go just reduce our purchase of the expansion vehicles we were buying for by that one. I, I don't like buying one by itself because you get an oddball vehicle that's maybe slightly different components, but it's better than losing $200,000 to pay for the funds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the reason that's not on the agenda today. Yeah, and that has to be a, that has to be a bus that meets by America and meets all the federal rules, which is why we're looking at the BYD. So they're still taking orders that can deliver in about 18 months. Great. Okay, thanks, Richard. Thank you. Ready for that update. Nick, let's jump right into the action items. You're yeah, up first. I think we can make this quick since Randy yeah. did a nice preview for me. <laughs> this is more of a correction than kind of housekeeping items. So, through our current purchasing policy, anything over $40,000 would need to go out for a formal bid. And fuel at times does exceed that. It could happen three times this year so far for diesel. So, um, back in 2006, the original change, we did a change in our purchasing policy. When their threshold was twenty five thousand dollars, that we could go up to forty thousand dollars for our fuel. In two thousand fourteen, we raised our threshold to forty thousand dollars. We did not change the fuel threshold any higher. So really, basically, all we need to do is take off the last sentence, sentence that says um, uh, the total purchase will not exceed forty thousand, and three or more quotes are required for the fuel to purchase fuel, which is the same as our purchasing policy. So if we just took off that last sentence and it said one exception to the $40,000 limit for competitive bids is to purchase fuel to continue the fixed route and or paratransit service road and we to take care of that issue. So that's all we're asking to do. And the $100,000 limit is the statutory as high as we can go. Uh, but tank was 9,000 gallons, we're paying $5 a gallon of fuel or 560, which we are currently. That's more than $40,000. And we bought a state contract, so if we don't need to go out and bid, but as Nick mentioned, we actually had deliveries that went over the 40,000 limit, and we were looking like, oh, wait a second, we can't do this, we need to fix this. Well, I would make a motion to approve the changes put forth by you. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second to, if I can just make one more sure. We'd like you to actually make the retroactive the purchases we made without noticing it. <laughs> that part. Yeah, it goes back to, uh, to May. Okay, so uh, <laughs> motion and a second. This is for resolution 2022 09. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Saw your thumb there, Jim. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Nick. Brenda, you're up next. Talk about authorization to open an AAC, excuse me, an AAC account with KeyBank. Okay. What it is, it's a warrant account <clears throat> that we can pay vendors and accept money from vendors if they no longer really want to accept checks or deal with the mail. So it's just a it's just a clearinghouse account where you put money in and it goes out to vendors. But we have I think four vendors now that want to put us on a timeline that after this date, they will not accept our warrants through the mail. So we, we need to keep them. up. Pardon me? <laughs> we don't have to pay them anymore. <laughs> yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> so keeping up with the times, we need to become a little more electronic with our payment process. That makes perfect sense. And then key bag is the bank. So the credit comes to the Shine County Treasurer is our treasurer. That's the bank they work with. So the account would need to be the key bank. Yes. Why it's selected for that. Okay. And it's a transfer from the county into ours. Same, mm -hmm. same thing as our payroll account. Okay. And I apologize. I said AHC, which was on the agenda, but it's actually ACA. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So we, we can get that correct. This is an action item, so I would entertain a motion. I move to approve resolution 2022 10. Second. Great, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Jim. Sorry your thumb. Ed, if you'd like to come up and tell us about the sealed bidding process for a marketing ban. So as you know, um, I can be before about trying to purchase vehicles and I've been trying to find a marketing ban. Um, either more likely a poor transit or something into that effect since January, um, with no avail. Uh, to purchase off the uh, contract has been closed. So I started looking around and found on uh, oh, when I went out purchasing rideshare vehicles, I found a Ford e transit at Ford Kirkland. Um, they are on the DDS contract. Uh, I went to the DES contract and built the same thing that's at Port of Kirkland and found that the DES contract was $309 more than what Kirkland will sell it to me for. Hmm. So I'm asking you guys to authorize to waive the sealed bid process um, so that we can purchase this marketing van, which will be a Ford E Transit. So it will be an electric um, marketing van instead of our gas powered 2004, we'll be replacing. Um, little cost savings there, no more fuel. Um, but the price on this thing is uh, $61,581.12, including tax. Um, that exceeds what we put in the capital budget of $50,000 by $11,518.12. And justification for going over is the gasoline version could have purchased for $50,000 at the time the budget was up. Now, with price increases we're seeing, and was finding used for transit vans and gasoline for 70,000, um, about cheapest we could find in the price. So, marketing doesn't need to go more than about 120 miles because they're only going in our area. And so, electric vehicle apps to work just what just fine as we happen to have a charger uh, available to plug it in. So, from an operation standpoint, it makes sense. And the one that they're currently using is quite old. It's a 2004 Chevy Express 15 passenger van with cold seats out of um, that we purchased from Ben Franklin, ben Franklin Transit. Was it? It was a van cool. had like 120,000 miles on it when we bought it. So, could you enlighten me on why we need this van, the marketing van? Wait for marketing. Well, so, I've been here. It basically would be used for when um, we go to different events in the community and we have a bunch of stuff, a hall tents and um, displays and 
um, just a variety of things that we use for our outreach events, you know, county fairs, farmers markets, um, community celebrations. Selena does probably 50 to 70 events a year. Um, some are indoors because of the weather, some are outdoors, and they're maybe a weekend long, a little bit an evening or an afternoon. But she's out there a couple times a week. That's something. So it's just a way we could get all of our equipment to these things pretty easily and have it, you know, something we can load and unload pretty pretty quickly and gives us a little bit of presence in this little van that sometimes runs, sometimes doesn't. It's <laughs> not the easiest thing to drive or load around. So I asked we, the same question in finance and many basically a freight van for all the marketing materials, which I didn't realize I'm do we have here. to go a more expensive route like a <clears throat> Electric? Is there well, we, we, couldn't find a, alternatives? we couldn't find a, a smaller vehicle anymore. Uh, I mean that that's been the problem is we need something that would be able to hold the tents um that we have and they're just larger enough that you need to have something that's a certain size. Quite a bit of stuff we can haul around. We don't use it all, but it's nice to have it in the vehicle so we don't have to unload it into a storage room or reload it. We can just kind of keep it all. At the ready, so whatever she needs to load on that is basically all there. And she seems to kind of restock, you know, things that she uses up on a regular basis, you know, things like that. But, uh, yeah, and this was a long discussion about exactly the same point of why can't we use staff cars? Why can't we do this? And it just, the case has been made. The other part of this that the intention is with this new vehicle is to try and acquire. Um, a, a, a nice wrap on it that we can use as a sort of advertising. And then rather than have us take a bus to many of these events, which we've been doing for years, which then requires someone to drive the vehicle to the event and takes it out of service for you know the day. If the vehicles are equipped appropriately, that can actually be the display. Uh, you know, they pull their awning off the front. And so the intention is to actually do more with it and not have to spend some of the money that we had in shuttling the vehicle to bring our vehicles to events. And there's still going to be some vehicles. Some of the people want to see, like the bus, they want to see a particular vehicle that we've got in our display or something that you know ties. But probably two thirds of the events that we're taking vehicles, we won't, won't have to in the future. So to me, that's a big part of the reason why it makes sense to do this. Thank you. And I've been to a couple of events where Slim has brought the old van, and boy, it's like not everything quite fits. It's hanging out the windows and out the back end. <laughs> So this this would be a big no. So this is an action item. I would entertain a motion to purchase the marketing man. I'll make that motion. And okay, we've got a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. <laughs> you get to the second one. It's fine. Okay. Great. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you to the hey. Jim. That passes unanimously. Okay. Oh, I did get an A? Yeah. I, I apologize. Okay. Okay. That was not a unanimous. It's close. It was close. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't go anywhere. I'm not. Okay. We got we've got more to talk. So about. so Randy kind of touched on this one also. The the this has also been on the budget since January. Uh, looking for a driver trade off vehicle, and we were going to electric on this also. Um, reduce the fuel cost and the maintenance cost of that driver trade off vehicle. So, driver trade off vehicle was one of Randy's questions. What is that? Um, we do driver trade outs here at Columbia Station and uh, where else? East Wenatchee. East Wenatchee. East Wenatchee. Mall. Mall. Um, so, driver ends a shift at either Columbia Station or East Wenatchee Mall. Another driver brings a vehicle from Columbia or from Old Station to either place, they trade vehicles out, drive back. So not a lot of miles on the vehicle every day. Um, so I've been looking for something electrical to just make it on a single charge every day, no problem. Um, selected the cheapest electric vehicle necessarily on the market right now, a Nissan Leaf. So I looked on a DES contract for a Nissan Leaf, haven't had one, haven't had one all year long, been looking to buy one privately, can't get one, can't get one all year long. Last month, looking around at other things, I found one online that was on a DES contract. So um, it is over in a dealership. The only dealership that's on the DES contract is down in 
close to Vancouver, Washington. Um, they had one, they have one. It's sitting there with our name on it. Um, we put $50,000 in the budget for this. Um, total cost for this vehicle is $42,627.84. Um, that's delivered to us. God, I don't have to drive it all the way here because it'd be a lot of charges getting here. Um, this does support our goals. Um, at this point, it would be we, we would like to keep all of the vehicles that we currently have kind of run short sometimes during the day, but normally we'd be replacing a vehicle. Um, you'll find out later. I'm asking for another one of these next year to uh, replace a very old Mazda that we put over 100,000 miles of doing that driver trade out deal on. But that's where I'm at with this one. I found a Nissan Leaf off the DES contract. Okay. Just out of curiosity, you said the purchase price was 42000 something. Yeah. The total price is 42627 And you had already budgeted in the budget $55,000? 50000 50000 I'm just curious. Why. Any, any, purchase, yeah. any purchase for 40 I think. Uh, I see. Okay. And so with tax and money changing that, right? <laughs> well, that's not not didn't that's not just good fuel. We are talking about rate of improvement because a lot more things are hitting that money. And so that's something to expect to see sometime the next. Nixon promised to get a purchasing policy for revision for about a year now. So <laughs> longer than that. <laughs> Randy, I'd love to see it when you put, I'd love to see it when you approve a, a budget. That, that it's in the budget, or if I stay under that amount, I can still do it. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, only the way it runs. So that's, that's why it's on the agenda. It's, it's over 40000 so I think more people to put this in. Thank you. So I would entertain a motion, Randy. Sure. I'll second Someone. it. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about driver and operation staff uniforms. Bam. Hello. So Randy covered it a little bit when discussing the finance committee meeting. We went out for solicitation for the uniform contract that we have ending at the end of this year, and it was for operations staff and drivers and the new contract would be for 2020 january 1st of this coming year through december 31st of 2025 with an option to extend through 2027 for two years and we found go usc go usa to be the most cost and labor efficient way it supports our goal of delivering um service with a high quality and professional appearance. And an alternative for you to consider would be resoliciting, but we found the all of the proposals to be competitively close in, in um, and competitively priced. So we are asking that we award the contract from RFP 2022-13 to go USA. And the proposed price for the items, they would be the exact same items for the current contract for the next year would be a 14% increase over the contract price for this year. And Sandy mentioned, Go USA is things like both because they're the current vendor and we've had really good luck with them, but they're local, which allows our staff to go down and size the uniform without having to order them. And then end up keeping a stock, which we used to do years ago. And at the end of the day, it was a large labor commitment of our own time to manage uniform deliveries and stocking size and sizing. And so having someone local that people will size themselves at saves us a ton of fucking money going forward. And I think the operators prefer that they can order them. Yes, they wear uniforms out, they can order replacements um, online, and it works really effectively from that perspective. Makes sense. Okay, this is an action item, so I would entertain a motion to use Go USA for the purchase of the uniforms. Can I get a second? Sorry. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, passes unanimously. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Lynn, you're up next. Hiring of a recruitment for the general manager position. Yeah, I uh, mentioned this at our last meeting um, and to, to the finance committee, as Randy mentioned, um, the recommendation to uh, extend or to enter into a contract and agreement with Kaufman um, recruitment. Profman executive recruitment firm. We did go out, we obtained three proposals, one from Profman, one from a company called Harris Consulting, and an additional one from ISGF. Um, the, the proposal from Profman was, um, we felt the most competitive. It was uh, reasonably priced at a cost of $18,500 plus expenses which we anticipate will not exceed $35,000 and probably maybe lower than that. Um, they also have a one-year guarantee. So if we recruit someone and it's not successful, they will go back out and do it, an additional recruitment, um, which I think is would be important. <laughs> um, after the finance committee meeting where we made this recommendation, I was asked to go out and um, contact different agencies in the state that had used Kaufman to get their opinion about how they, what their service was like. I talked to three different systems and I got glowing um, recommendations. So our recommendation to um, award a contract with them stands. Um, so that's what we're looking for uh, from the board tonight. And the one year guarantee is at no further cost. That's right. Did we already pursue um, looking at looking at hiring from within? Well, we have had those discussions in the past, um, but we don't feel that we have that candidate ready for August or October next year. Yeah, and yeah. someone from within could still apply. Yes, definitely. Yes. And then, always, they're always they're always well, and we didn't do a succession plan. Um, we weren't aware that Richard was, I think his timeline kind of moved up faster than he expected. Um, so we are doing succession planning with some of the other positions for folks that are getting ready to retire, like Nick's position or my position. Um, but we, I think, I think because Richard's timeline cranked up a little faster than it was going to. Yeah, I, I think the other part is most of the senior staff is also getting very close to retirement, whether they've actually given us dates or not. I, I gave one to Lynn uh, without meaning to, <laughs> but- uh, I left in October. <laughs> I, I found that out in the Washington State Transit Association meeting. That was interesting. <laughs> but that, but that's part of it. And the board had had a conversation and I think the intention was to recruit nationally, try to get someone that's got some of the same legislative experience, or at least some of that and see if it's available. And then, yes, the potential of looking inside as well. If we happen to have a candidate that can compete well, I don't have any, I, I don't have any problem doing that. We've got good staff, but I don't think there's anyone who met the criteria the board was laying out to me of what they would like to see. We've dealt with problem for about 20 years. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that as we start into this contract, you are very clear what you're looking for. So they're 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 aiming at the right place, uh, sort of the skill sets. And I, I mean, what what was passed on to me was someone that has got some of the same experiences. I think that might be difficult. There's yeah, most people I know are also retiring. Uh, so um, there's a little bit of that, but but being that it said, I, you know, I'm you know, a nationwide search, nationwide search is intended to open the doors up. And I think this is an attractive place to be. Um, the process that they'll go through, um, they will. Uh, want to sit down with the board and talk about what's your vision for this position for the future. I mean, we're making a lot of big decisions right now, and, and understanding we have a new general manager coming on board is, you know, the, there's just a lot of things happening. So they'll want to sit down with the board and um, gather information about what your philosophy is and what you want to see in a leader going forward. Um, so that'll be an important part. And as I mentioned at the finance committee, We'd probably like to put together a, um, a committee that's involved um, 
with the recruitment process, um, identifying what we want to look like as we go forward. Thank you. Okay, this is an action item. So again, I would uh, accept the motion. So we'll, can I get a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Lynn. We're going to go right into staff reports. So, Lynn, don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, I won't. I'll stay right here. Okay. Um, so, in as of November, we um, started out with 80 full-time operators at the beginning of the month. I'm sorry, I have to look at this on my phone because I forgot to bring the report. Um, we have had uh, one person quit and one person be terminated. And we've also had four people that were hired into training um, for a total of 82 operators. The, that's our total roster at the end of this month or as of today, I guess. Um, we have two people who are out on extended absences and four people who are still in training. So currently we have 76 um, full-time operators available to operate service. You have three people in training? No, we have four because John Wald is there. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it would have been five, but it's only four. <laughs> that was the one person who was um, quit. So just to remind everyone, um, the budget and uh, was authorized at 95 operators uh, in service. We started in July. This patient had 83 of them, which is us, which is why we unfortunately had service cuts in October. It is what we're getting the numbers. So, okay. Yeah, to, to Paul's point, we did hire four people. We have one individual who was in a training class by themselves who was almost out. And then we just hired four additional drivers, but one of them had some medical issues in his family and he it was not a good time for him to continue, so he left. Thanks for that report. Hey, Richard, you wanna get us your system for phone? Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So for weekday uh, fixed route, uh, our ridership in October was down 5.1% from last month. Um, and that actually reflects the service cuts. And so we had, October was the first month of the cuts we had to make going forward, and you're seeing that in the numbers. Um, let's see, it was up 8.6% from last year, up 22.1% from 2020, which is of course pandemic and down 23.1 percent from 2019 so our pre-pandemic numbers um, so it's significantly down uh, there saturday we were up uh so saturday was 1665 um average morning with a fixed route that's up one percent from last month up 13.1 percent from last year 17.8 cent percent from the pandemic and up 4.7 percent from 2019. And so Saturday did have a significant expansion of service um, in July of this, this summer. We did not cut much of the Saturday service, and so you don't see the, the drop off there. Sunday. Sunday, uh, 1151. Uh, boarding's on the fixed route, that's up 8% from last month, up 46.6% from last year, up 80% from 2020, which is the year we started some of this service. Um, and there's two things out of that that I want to share is, one is when you start a new service, you really do need to give it about three years to develop. That's when you start seeing what can generate through. You, you evaluate it at nine, uh, you know, Nine months is probably a fair point. A year and a half is you, you give you a sense of whether you're actually going to succeed with it. But you're, what you're going to get to at some point is, is usually about three years out. Uh, 
you can see that with that consistent growth from the third, third, third year period. Now, it's pandemic in the middle of this, so that had some influence on those numbers as well, but just you know, that sort of trend issue. Sunday is about half what we Saturdays. Uh, our intention is for Sundays to match Saturday at some point. We have enough operators, um, and we didn't cut any of the Sunday service uh, this time, so we're just not seeing any impact there. DART. So this is our uh, general public dial ride that we operate in Leavenworth and Chelan. Um, we added some same day service in Leavenworth in October. Our ridership did grow to 1,523 mornings over the month. That's an increase of 16.8% from last month, a 46% from last year, 173% from 2020, and up 123% from 2019. And for the board members that weren't all here at the time, when this service was started uh, in 2019 in Chelan, this was an experiment to see whether we could effectively meet some of the community needs with a dial ride vehicle. And it has, it took a while to catch, but it has far exceeded our expectations and actually is a really effective way of meeting rural communities, transportation needs because they're just really responsive. Theoretically, as you watch this, if you see travel patterns, and you might create a fixed route out of it, but at this point, there really isn't enough travel pattern to justify converting any of these two routes. And then we just added this same day function to Leavenworth, which is the month we saw the flagship there. We don't have to schedule anything in advance anymore. Mm -hmm. On time performance on the system was 88%, which is the lowest it's been in 25 years. Um, that's down 1.2% from last month, down 3.3% from last year, down 8.4% from 2020. Um, and that is almost entirely construction. Um, and it's going to be much worse this month because of the closure of uh, Highway 28 and the diversion across the bridge to get uh, through. That's causing all sorts of havoc in the system right now. But that's traffic has really increased, and that is really impacting our ability to operate on time. Um, we are tweaking a bit, trying to make adjustments, but of course that has costs. They require more operators. We don't have more operators to put out, so it's not a great situation. Uh, collisions. October was a bad month. <laughs> we had five uh, collisions. Uh, were so five for the month. Our goal for the year was nine. We are at nineteen so far. Uh, so we're way out of uh, the ballpark. <laughs> Um, a bunch of these are relatively small. I mean, they, they all, to, well, to be on this chart, they have to cause at least $300 in damage. But if you take a mirror off of a electric vehicle, those are almost a thousand bucks. Um, and we have quite a few mirror takeoffs on these because of narrow parts, clipping our vehicle and clipping them, that kind of thing on the narrow parts on the roads. That being said, it's still a huge increase and it's still an issue. Um, there is a surprising correlation. You know, at least more than half of these are people who've been here less than a year. Um, and that's partially because we've had a lot of people that hire. And that's, you know, your risk is higher. So our safety people are looking, trying to figure out what we can do. It's not a positive trend. But I think there are factors that are driving some of this, and it's not, we haven't had any horribly serious accidents um, in numbers, but um, you don't want to see this. <laughs> you know, these are the ones that count, and you don't want to see this. Uh, complaints, there were 13 in October. Um, no, again, no pattern to them. There were all sorts of complaints all in you know, a variety of different things, uh, but those are complaints that are valid, ones that we can verify, and yes, in fact, we did something wrong here and recognize that reality out of 90,000 rides. So it's not a huge number, but it is definitely more than we want to see. Uh, paratransit, weekday boardings were 221 average boardings on the paratransit on Link Plus. Uh, that is up 5.7% from last month. 30.8% from last year, up 57% from 2020, and up 11% from 2019. So, pre pandemic. So, we fully recovered ridership uh, on 
paratransit and have exceeded it. Um, and that's primarily because we operate later in the evening hours, and so there's more opportunities for paratransit riders to go. Under federal law, you cannot cut paratransit. You have to operate the same hours and days. You have a fixed route, and you need all the demand that's available at those times. So it's, it's a tough one. Saturday. So we had uh, 92 boardings on Saturday. Saturday was down 13.3% from last month, down 8% from last year, up 64% from the pandemic, up 16% from 2019. Um, I'm not really sure what the down was. I I can't be making a guess at this point. Um, you're talking four days, so that makes it difficult to look at trends on Saturdays, but they're down a bit. And then Sunday, uh, we were at 83 uh, boardings, which is exactly the same as it was last month, so even. 80.4% um, up from last year, 261% from 2020. And after the pandemic, restrictions sort of relaxed. This really took off in ridership. Um, again, very frail populations that weren't going to go outside much during the pandemic. And so you just see the results of that. On time performance was 96%, so staying very much on time, um, you know, down a bit from where earlier in the year. So you're seeing some traffic impacts, but we're still doing exceptionally well on all time performance and paratransit. Service hours. Uh, so we were at 448 hours uh, on weekdays. That's down 6.5% from last month. And that is the service time. Um, down 6.1% from last year. Down 0.07% from the pandemic. Um, and that's down 4.3% from 2019. So we're actually operating less hours weekdays than we were prior to um, any of the service expansion. So it's essentially going back. We are operating Sundays and Saturdays, which is different, but weekdays is actually a little less than we were three years ago. Uh, Saturday service hours, uh, 225. Uh, that's down 2.2% um, from last month, down 7.5% from last year up 14% from the pandemic and up 32% from 2019. So Saturday did see an expansion of service uh, last this, this summer. We didn't cut, we cut very limited amount of Saturday service uh, this, this month. <clears throat> and then Sunday has 164 hours. That's up 3.8% from last month, up 25.3% from last year. Up 62% from 2020 and up 28%. Uh, I'm sorry, we just 69%. We didn't operate Sundays until 2020. Um, we didn't cut any Sunday service. And of course, we have to meet all the demand on paratransit. So the reason the number went up was more paratransit hours. Uh, miles being road calls, uh, we were up 28.5% from last month. So more road calls. Um, and up 21% from last year. Um, when I asked Ed what drove this, he said just a bunch of small things, um, plus some issues with chargers, uh, and, uh, causing a few problems. So it does bounce around month to month. We kind of watch where we're at, you know, and see where, see where it goes next month as well. And then cost per hour was um, at 157.51 this month. That's uh, down 5.7% from last month. So over our goal by 5.6%. But if you look at this cumulatively, and you'll notice this number bounces around month to month, depending on how things hit the financials. But on a cumulative for 10 months, we're about three, uh, three tenths of a percent under our goal for the year. So um, now I actually think it's going to be hard to make the goal on this one for the year because the budget was built on operating a lot more service. So you amortized your fixed costs over a lot more hours than we're actually operating. And every time you cut service, you increase the cost per hour um, because you're now spreading that cost over less service. So with the service cut, that's part of the reason we're still Other than that, it would have been a good month on, on the yeah, numbers. So yeah, what you're, you're seeing the results of that service cut. And as you've heard with the, um, Staffing report, 
we're just holding if we get four positions we'll be back to where we were but we just can't restore anything uh so we're not, i'm not looking to cut anything in january at this point but we're also not looking to restore anything in january so yeah. any questions for richard thank you richard for that report nick you want to talk about i guess this is a uh, discussion workshop yes I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. While Nick's getting set up, I just wanted to pass on another thing that I forgot to add the manager for. We talked a little bit about momentum, momentum dynamics or wireless charging, having a few issues we're dealing with and then lining a bunch of staff while the other wireless charge charging provider uh wave just went through 30 percent of their staff being like a little bit of a sale to support their pressure so it looks like it's both of them are struggling with the panic uh with going forward and so pass that on for okay so we're ready to go on to our 2023 budget pardons wait 2023 <laughs> it is hard to believe all right, so this is kind of a workshop where we put together a PowerPoint and then we have some handouts for you. Shouldn't take too long. Okay, for our projected 2023 revenues, total revenue is $31,561,964. It's a lot of money. Sales tax is the bulk of it, about $24 million. The 5307 formula grants, almost 5.3 million. The DOT, the consolidated grants are about $2 million. Interest, 169000 which is probably a little low, considering we have more money in the bank and interest rates are going up a little bit. And other, which consists of leases, WSTF grant, and other events, is about 20000 almost 21000 the total of 31000 31 million. So how does that compare to last year? Last year, we had 25907000 This is about $5.6 million increase, or about 22%. And just to sort of pass that on, that is to a great degree the result of both a very healthy local economy on sales tax. But uh, the federal program went up by 23%, I believe is the number. It's in the low 20s. Um, and then the state tripled their allocations of state funds through the NAC and it's quite a lot. And those were unexpected revenue wins that. Uh, Came the system as well. Okay. Anything else? No, I don't want to share that. All right. So, how this plays out. So, the 22 budgeted sales tax is 18367000 And that was based on the 2019 sales tax. So, we didn't know what this year was going to bring. And because we thought 21 could be an anomaly and where we're going to have the big increases again. But we did get that fifth, tenth. Uh, so, we amortized that out and added 5%. More over the 2019 sales tax to get the 18 million. Well, actually, we came in at we're projecting about almost 23 million dollars. So it's about 4.5 million dollars over what we projected. So that and then so we did five percent over what we're projecting for next year. That's where we get the 24 million. Federal federal the 5307 formula grant did go up a bit. Um, it, it and so it's we're coming in about 5.3 million dollars. Consolidated grants went up a little bit too. The special needs is a big increase. It went up 46%, almost 1.6 million for two years. Interest income, uh, leases, and then other makes the total revenue tax is about 24 million or 32 million dollars. Five percent number, just so everyone has a common understanding of that. If you take our historical increase in sales tax year to year over 30 years, it's a little over five percent, about five and a half percent currently, and maybe a bit more in this last couple of years, but they have been for 25 years, right about five percent. You know, occasionally less, there's been more, but that's where it averages. And so for our budget, we typically use five percent as a conservative safe number because we've got many, many years of it being that. With the current state of the economy, did we really expect increased sales tax? From 22 to 23, I mean, it's it's going to be tougher in 23 than it was in 22 for the citizen, for the everyday citizen. Well, if you look at what's happening in the public sector, just the spending that's already authorized, you know, the, um, you know, the airport, data centers, everything else, that should 
keep the construction dollars flowing, at least on that side of the equation, which is why we're not projecting a 24% increase like we saw this year, going back to the average. But, but there was a lot of public spending happening that's going to happen next year. Um, capital budgets, the DUD and the board, uh, and Microsoft, <laughs> and uh, on both sides of the river. I mean, they're going for, you know, they have, they're building on the, on the at least the first buildings. So we have good reason to believe that is probably a safe number based on that. It's, that's where that's why you have an increase because we're assuming that maybe the local consumer numbers are going to drop because it was 24% this year, I think, is going to be an increase. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. We try to be realistic, but conservative. So kind of what we get. I think it's going to be a tough year. Yeah, it's you know it's fascinating. I it'd be really interesting to see how how our ballot is going to hold. The other thing that's interesting is when we have a national recession, we typically lag by a year or two when the impacts hit us. Uh, so, like I said, I'm comfortable with the numbers this year, but I think it is going to be really fascinating to see how this plays out. Okay, 2023 operating expenses. So total operating budget came in at 25 million 122. The bulk of that's wages and benefits, about 18 million, a little over 18 million. Supplies, which includes fuel, comes in about 2.8. Services is next, about 1.7. Utilities, purchase transportation, that's any transportation that we hire out for others to provide for us. Insurance went up a bit because of the rideshare program and additional miles planned. Other includes dues, travels, training, board per diem, leases, et cetera, like that, for a total of $25 million. So, and Jim has a question too. Jim, you have a question? Yeah, I don't want to be a pest here, but I'm still looking at the video from Richard's uh, graphs rather than the budget on oh, the share oh. screen. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. You see it? You see that, Jim? Not yet. I don't. I don't see a share screen at all now. Yeah. There we go. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Great. Sorry about that. Okay. That's so okay. I don't need to know the numbers. <laughs> Okay, you got this? So one, one underlying issue in here is we have budgeted based on actually hiring the employees because we have we have commitment to service levels that in, in the sales tax. And so the budget's based on actually being able to achieve that. Whether we're actually able to do that is a real question going forward. So I want to be upfront about that. But the budget built based on 103 employees. And doing our service expansion that we um, yes the month exactly it's carrying that out so we said we don't want to not put it in here if the labor economy improves and we can do it and we want to follow through on promises made to the community so the money is there to do it whether we're going to be able to spend all of it with you know hopefully the situation changes but we just don't know. All right, so our 2023 operative budget came in at 25 million compared to last year at 21 million seven hundred thousand. So about a 16 percent income or 3.4 million dollars. It's mostly due to the plan service expansion, which we just talked about. Succession plan planning, additional fuel, medical insurance increased across the board about five percent. So we want to kind of move this line out, uh, screen everything up. There it is. Okay. Okay, so operations, let's take it department by department, went up about 10%, about a million dollars. And this is once again, because of the planned expansion and increased coach operators from 95 to 103. And as you heard from Lynn's report, that might be a challenge. <laughs> um, and we're still under negotiations with the operators, with the bargaining units, so we don't have wage increases for them as of yet. Admin and board of directors, admin went up about $16,000 or 3%, slightly increased the mark, internal marketing and postage and benefits. Board of directors went up about 9%, and that's increase in wages and benefits for the new person to take in Laura's place, which she's leaving, but we're not saying anything about that, are we? 
Finance went up about 34% to $300,000. Most of this is succession planning and, and changing changing things up. Brenda is retiring in July. And so we're bringing a new person in in March to replace her. They need to understand how to close the books, close the year end, the month end. There's a lot of things Brenda does that nobody else knows what she does. <laughs> and she does, and she does, she takes on a lot. So it's going to take a while to get someone up to speed with that. Uh, we're moving Justin to finance manager. So when we hire the new person, we'll have a new team in place moving forward. Um, and he'll be taken over from me. That'll give me a year to help work with him. Uh, purchasing agent, which was approved in this year, we never had last year. We combined the purchase, the procurement special, procurement contract specialist and purchasing agent under one position that did not work out well for us. So we we hired a purchasing agent who company wide buyer. And then Sam took her job for uh, in March of this year. So she started part way. And then we increased security uh, for Columbia Station by about $56,000 for a total of $144,000 total security. Computer services went up about 14% or $145,000. And once again, it's staffing, a little bit of staffing. We have replaced IT specialists in May. We have one of them retiring on June 1st. So we're on wants to do one in on May 1st. We had an additional IT specialist the last quarter of 2023. He's going to reevaluate that as the year goes on to see if we need a fourth individual. We added a couple planning software programs, small tools and equipment increased. We have laptops uh, for each maintenance tech. We'll sign one out to them. And we have six, which is 19 of those. Well, 19, including the remote work. Uh, so we're, if you do remote work or go out of town, we issue out a, a laptop for the glove. Uh, Columbia Station camera replacement, and then we're moving to the MS365 Business Premium, which is a cloud-based Microsoft service. Admin services actually had a decline. And so this is part of the succession and moving things around a bit. Move current benefits coordinator, which is Julie, to the human resources assistant manager position. She's going to be taken over for Lynn. And when we pull the plug. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, replace benefits coordinator position. We have a full year for the new uh, trainer. It was approved in 2022, but not in the 22 budget. Then we moved guest services, mobility manager, and travel trainer to planning. And then we took out the $250,000 for in house COVID testing that we potentially would have needed this year. We didn't know if we needed it, we didn't have to have it. So we took it out. Planning went up a lot, about 135%, almost 1.2 million. Uh, part of it, a lot of it's staffing. New principal planner uh, position, which will be not in this current budget, it will be advertised fairly soon, start next year. This is a position you know, by the last month. Move mobility manager, trainer, and admin services planning. Move guest services supervisor and representatives to planning. Move transit analyst from finance to planning. And they have a US 2 highway federal small starts evaluation study going on in there. Uh, additional super graphics and ride share graphics and increase for onboard surveys, video production, advertising, marketing increases, and website refresh. Facility maintenance went up about 20%, about $223,000 uh, for one additional facility maintenance worker. Once again, it was approved in 2022, but not in the budget. So that was a big part of it. And we're you know, adding more to our park and ride and bus stops. So we put more money in for improvements and maintenance for that. And increased utilities was a big chunk of it too. Vehicle maintenance went up about 16%, almost a million dollars. And it was almost all of it fuel. Diesel and gas doubled, electricity for EV buses doubled, tires went up again, and a new line item for ride share maintenance, and a little bit of money for technician training. Electricity doubled? Well, more buses we use on okay. the road, so we have to. The, the rate didn't change, change but the rate you're using a lot more electricity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. will be. So, once again, all those departments got up to about $25 million operating budget. Proposed. Um, okay, capital is coming up. Capital budget for 2023 is 34665000 dollars 
Some of these are carryover projects. We got three new 35 foot BYD buses be arriving in April. Not from what? Easy Street. Easy Street, you have two roundabout, which was supposed to be built this year. Now it's scheduled for next year, next spring. Next bus signage, a small amount. It's like, I think we put $45,000 in for it. This gives real time bus, real time for buses when they're going to actually arrive. Starting in that level where since we have problems there, keeping on schedule. New paratransit battery electric vehicle pilot project, eight new 30 foot BYDs, and four additional rideshare vehicles. So those are all in the budget. We're just carrying those over from 22 to 23. The new projects we have, we have from facility redesign. We just entered in a contract with RH2 and TCF. So they have phase one, we have that budgeted in there. Phase two, we put in more money for the actual, once we find out what we want, we'll go ahead and do the final bid design, the bid specifications, and ready to go out and bid, which should be ready by the end of next year. Third, Rock Island and Rock Island Park and Rides, put money in for both those. A placeholder for a roundabout at Crawford and Okanagan. This is a very busy intersection. And right now we do a lot of left hand turns from Crawford, no, Okanagan to Crawford, and it's just a lot of traffic. So they're putting one down. What's the next street? Yeah. Metal. Met they're putting one on the Metal, and the city does not have money for this one at this time, but we put a placeholder in case we can work something out. Hay Canyon property purchase, Town Toyota Center Bridge or Tunnel, six new 40 foot electric buses plus chargers. This is the bus go ones potentially. Three new plow trucks and other miscellaneous equipment for a total of 34 million. So the uh, town Toyota center, um, that's probably less likely than it was last month. The state's not sure they're going to have money available to do something. So it's in here if the grant dollars are available to, to do something. That's probably not likely to happen, is what, what we heard. Mm -hmm. Last week. Yeah. All right. Hey, Brenda, do you want to? Yeah, right there. You want to run these out and I'll pull it up the screen. So now we'll go to the, um, we got a, a budget summary, capital budget, cash flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you go to the screen share? Share. Oh, it. Oh, oh, oh. All right, Jim, can you see that? Jim? Assume he is. He can. Okay, what Brenda's handing out is the budget summary. And we have this. The next sheet after that is expense by category. So you can look at the expenses by wages, services, and that. And it shows the increases based upon uh, budget, year and projection, and current year budget. Um, the next one after that is our capital budget and then a 10 year cash flow. So, what we're going to start with is just go through the actual. Okay, so the operating budget summary you have. So, let's walk you through it. On the left hand side, you have kind of the categories, either revenues or expenditures by department or type of revenue. The second column in is the 22 approved budget that was approved for 22. The column B is actually the 22 year in projection as far as revenue in or expenses that we actually project to spend. And then the 2023 budget is comparable. And then we have the F and G is comparison between the budget to projection and then budget to budget in the last two columns. So as we talked about the revenues in 2022, our revenue expense budget was 25 million nine hundred thousand. We're projecting over 30 million, and uh, this year for 2023, we're, we're projecting about 31.5. Yeah, here are the operation expenses. We just went through those departments and by department. Here's the numbers for those. So operations. We had a budget of about $10,700,000. We're spending about 8.8. .8. The budget of 11.7 for 
next year. It's about a 33% increase over projection and about 10% over budget. And it goes on down for, for each department down, one all the way down to the total. So right down here, this is excess revenue over expenditures. We're estimating about a 4.2 million excess. We have about a, actually close to about a $10 million excess over expenditures for this year. Next year for 2023, we're anticipating about $6.4 million surplus. Down below a little bit further, we have ending operating cash before transfers. So we're projecting about 28 million. We came in right around at 28 million, 900,000. And we're gonna to transfer to our contingency fund to keep it at about two months, about $400,000. Transfer to vehicle replacement, 5 million. To facility reserves, another 4 million for and our ending cash will be nineteen million five hundred thousand. Everyone okay so far? How do you choose those numbers to transfer over to each of the reserves? It depends on the capital purchases. So we have capital reserve accounts that we keep everything. We have our facilities, we have our vehicles, uh, facilities, and uh, uh, contingency accounts separate. And so when we pull capital items out of that, then we that fill it with our revenue that we from the transfer from our revenue accounts. Is that pretty consistent year to year? Uh, depending on the capital projects this year, it went up a little higher. Yeah. So, yeah. but most part, most times it's right around two and a half to three million dollars. So it yeah, has been in years past. Uh, this is performance goals. So the fixed route are fully allocated costs. About 19 million eight hundred thousand demand response is about 5.3 million for the 25 million month 44. Actual service hours in 2022 is about 106,000 hours. Paratransit's 28,000 for a total of about 134,000 total service hours. In 2023, we're anticipating 126,000. So that's a 20,000 hour increase or 19% increase. Paratransit, we're bumping that up about to 30,000 hours, about 1,800 hours, which is about the 6.3% increase, which down below your boardings, so the cost per hour for fixed route is about $157 per hour run. Demand response is 176. Cost per boarding for fixed route based upon our budget and estimated boardings is about $18 per person. Uh, demand response is about $72 per person. Cost reporting revenue hour, about $9 for fixed route and $267 for demand response. So our total boardings we anticipate for 2023 is about a little under 1.1 million. So that's a 19% increase and about 73,000 for demand response, about a 6.3% increase. Okay. Any questions so far? We're not assuming efficiency improvements in the operation. Primarily, we would like to try and get those at lunch. But if you put new service out, it typically grows over the like years and the costs come down in the second and third year on those numbers. But trying to make those assumptions early on, let's just be upfront with the number is if the number goes, the cost goes up for passing years, you're not getting at that efficiency in the first year. You get it further down. <clears throat> okay, the next sheet is. Jim, can you see that? <laughs> this is a kind of a, we like this graph. It kind of shows you what our expenditures compared to last year's budget and are currently actually what we spent this year's budget. So up in the very top left-hand column of wages benefits. So in 2022, we had about $9.3 million worth of wages. We anticipate spending about 8.4. 2023, it went up to 10700000 So you have a $2.2 million increase over projection and a $1.3 million increase over budget in the percentages. And it goes all the way down benefits and then it's services, materials, utilities, purchase, transportation, and other things. So you see kind of a kind of a comparison of how we compare the last year in these certain categories. Anybody have any questions on this one? Not so far. Okay. Stop sharing that one. And we'll do the capital. 
Okay, so we have a capital threshold of five thousand dollars. Anything over five thousand dollars actually needs to be capitalized if it's a product or a product or an asset that we can capitalize and depreciate. Services don't. So some services that we plan maybe that we thought would turn into a capital item, if they don't turn into a capital item, we have to actually expense them. So that's some of the reasons why our operating expenses go up higher. Uh, but for carryover, like we talked about, we have three gilded bus, uh, replaced three gilded buses with BYDs, and they're due here in April, 2.6 million. Eight BYDs is 6.4. I'll back up here a little bit. So on the left-hand side, we have the type of uh, capital item that we're purchasing. Any grants we're going to receive, what's coming out of our reserve accounts, the total capital budget, and then anything if we spent anything towards that capital item so far. So uh, as you can see, we have eight, eight BYDs, and they should be delivered July and the February. But no, the eight, excuse me. Well, the eight were April. It's all about July. Oh, come on, it's got to be here. Uh, one pair of grants is not back in the UAD plan, they're actually on the line being built. So, it's still blowing with July. <laughs> um, I didn't say what year, though. Uh, one pair of transit electric pilot vehicle that's about we put four hundred thousand dollars in. I don't think that's found anything actually yet at this point. Uh, four more rideshare vehicles, we approved 10. We've purchased six so far this year, so we're just carrying that money over for, the, for next year. Uh, Easy Street Roundabout, the US2, so that's 185,000. Started at 110. When I put a couple of lights in, that went to 165, and then inflation bumped it up to 185. Leavenworth Roundabout, that is in design process right now. We spent about 150,000, so we're hoping it comes in less than 3.8 million. Next bus signage, we put forty thousand dollars in that. And that'll mostly that will twenty five thousand will cost to outfit a lot of work for those signs. Uh, moving down, uh, facility redesign. We have a three hundred thousand dollar grant for the engineering for the electrical infrastructure, and it's about seven hundred fifty thousand. So actually, the reserve should be dropped down to four hundred fifty on that one. Uh, East Wenatchee Park and Ride, we put seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to build that out. <laughs> Put seven hundred fifty thousand dollars into the Rock Island Park and Ride. All of these promises <laughs> we have a design. Uh, four BYD chargers to install about seventy five thousand dollars. Three community art bus stop projects. These are to identify or to take. Just any more. Yeah, sure. So we're planning to have a more comprehensive bus stop planning process. So. We're going to be putting together bus stop design guidelines, which we don't really have right now. We're going to be prioritizing where different amenity improvements go, kind of like where you know shelters need to be added, where we need benches, et cetera. And so as part of that, um, we're hoping to look to some peer agencies and what they've done in terms of some community art type projects um, for like you know a special type of investment in each of our communities to have this like kind of more showcase bus stop examples throughout the service area. So that's kind of that idea. She was thinking Shalan would be a good place to start. Shalan would be a nice place. Yeah, it's pretty nice when there's Center Street and Lake Slack. Yeah. Like, like yeah. The school and the, the park down there, and you're having a pull out. So, yeah, think of the downtown one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Crawford and Okanagan Roundabout, $2 million into that as a placeholder. A Canyon property, I highlighted it because we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, TTC access project, this is a $12 million into the tunnel. Uh, vehicles, we have six 40 foot electric buses, 4.2 million uh, electric chargers on top of that, 180,000. Three facility plow trucks, 225 electric car for driver replacement, and some serotonin uh, lift. There are four post lifts that we can put mobile lifts using the ground, stick one of the tires, and the plus. For a total of uh, $34,665,000. Any questions on that? I have a question on the 40 foot electric buses. Do we have, is there a need that they fill up to capacity versus the 30 foot? Well, no. Do we really need it? The reason that we're looking at a 40 foot bus at all is because e bus doesn't make anything smaller than a 40 foot bus. And we can get the range to operate with the 40 foot coach. We occasionally 
the loss. It's not on a regular basis, but it is probably once every two weeks, we end up having standees on, on, on the bus. Uh, the peak travel time, so about once a day, the morning, usually at 7 o'clock to rainy at that bus is usually got 33 or 34 people on it. The bus is seat 38. Um, so the 30 foot bus seats 22. So they're too small for what we have there. So that, that's where we can get 40 foot on those routes at all. And, uh, they, on, a, they, on a higher. Yeah, and they right. used to actually have more people in the college with more in, in, in service. Where college has said they're going back to in person classes entirely next year. So we're assuming we're going to gain that ridership back. So it probably does need it for that peak period. We really don't want standees on the Shalana because of the Kirby Road. Okay. And the, the chargers, where are those going to be? Six chargers? They would be at the, at the yard. So the at intention the is we'll plug them out. We'll plug them in uh, overnight and you might plug in midday uh, at the yard. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So I believe the next is a closed session. Next oh, is a closed session. Yeah. Clarification G McIntyre for the Oh. Oh, shall we do that? Now your name is on. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't want to yeah I, if it's okay, I, I, I didn't bring the 10 year cash flow up. Do you have a copy of it? Um, we have, it looks very. Yes. I mean, so we've done this for 20 years. We've been here. We lay out based on what our budget is and based on our regional expectations. This is where we think our money is going to be at, in 10 years out. And the idea, this is that point of question, are we sustainable? Do we have the resources to do what we lay down? Um, with the surprising bump in sales tax collection for the last two years, it is juice these numbers up so that there's a reserve, you know, there's money left at the end here to do something. And Clay, and regarding your comment, I think the sales tax, we did a two or three percent increase for years out in that two percent during that kind of cash flow, so that we're very, very conservative. If you look at it, a 3.7 percent increase in revenue than a seven percent increase in expenses. So, uh, I'm trying to be very, yeah, exactly. And the idea is that this is not intent, we'll, we'll do better. Than this. this is the conservative assumption that in case something goes wrong, you're not committing, you can tell you're not committing to something that we can't afford to manage five years from now. So, if I could make a recommendation, our attorney has to leave at five o'clock sharp. At no oh, she does. And we had a couple of weeks, a veteran session, a whole session, she needs to attend to. So, we to do it. I think if you all have it, right? Yeah. yeah, we already have it. So unless anyone has any questions um, about that, I think we move forward to the closed session. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Nick. And just to clarify, as we move into closed session, you have an executive session after that. We do. Are you intending to come back into open session before we have closed yes. session? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We are going to move into the closed session. Uh, Councillor, how long are you going to need for the closed session? Um, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah, no later. I mean, she has to leave the library here for the executive session. Well, so. I have a little bit of a yeah, okay. 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 All right. Well, then let's let's go ahead and, and we'll come back. We're going to go into closed session. We'll come back at five. Okay. Okay. Let's do that. I will be logging into the different Zoom that I um, provided you the link with. So I'll close the session now and I'll um, resend the link to you so you're able to log in for the closed session. I was saying,